Magandang araw mga kababayan. We're back in TVUP, TV Ops Science Innovation Series. And our topic today is very exciting. It's complexity science. I'm Giselle Concepcion, a professor at the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman. I do research on marine drug discovery and development. And with me are my co-hosts, Fidel Nemenzo, professor of mathematics, majoring in number theory and coding theory as his area of research. We have Benji Vallejo, professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology. He's a biogeographer and ecologist. And we have two guests, our young professors and scientists from the Institute of Mathematics, Professor Joma Escaner, who is into differential equations and mathem mathematical modeling and head maths, finance, mathematics. And we have Associate Professor John Rob Bantang of the National Institute of Physics, who is an expert in comple complexity science. So uh, I'd like to um, start this exciting discussion with um, the rich, diverse expertise of our guests by asking Fidel to um, explain to our audience what complexity science means. What does it cover? When you think of complexity science, it's really um, a framework for analyzing systems. No? My main question, what is common, what, what do things such as Facebook, social networks, traffic, ecosystems, even the finance market, what do they have in common? You know? These are examples of complex systems. You know? A complex system basically is, is a dynamical system of, of different parts interacting. You know? But the, the behavior of the entire system is uh, determined by the interaction of the parts. You know? Actually, I wanted to ask, um, uh, John Robb, who is an expert in complex systems, what is the simplest uh, explanation of what a complex system is? Uh, what is the difference between a complicated system and a complex system? Well, uh, one would, uh, I would think of uh, complexity science uh, first based on its uh, term. When you say complex, it's the opposite of simple. It means that uh, complex systems are actually composed of simple systems being brought together by something. And that something is uh, the, exactly the point that you're trying to say, that there's interaction between these simple parts. And the thing with complex systems is that their behavior cannot be simply uh, derived from the sum total or the average of the individual parts that composes it, but instead it is very dependent more into the interaction between the parts. Uh, in this case, uh, according to the complexity science point of view, you can, it's very difficult, if, if, if you can even, understand a complex system by simply looking at the parts. Rather, you have to look at the complex system as a whole, as a one system. And uh, here, it's, uh, the difficulty arises because the usual uh, physical and mathematical techniques uh, is very difficult to be applied to them. For example, thermodynamics does not follow. Uh, it's, I mean, you, you cannot apply thermodynamics very simply to these systems. For example, when you talk about uh, granular systems, this is one, another one. It's like when you, I don't know, when you, uh, uh, when you look into rice, uh, I think many of our audience will be familiar when you, when you try to remove the palai from the rice. Uh, usually you shake it. And it turns out that shaking is actually the right way to do this. Because according to, to uh, experimental uh, evidences, the palai actually goes on the surface. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this, is, uh, this cannot be... Uh, described by, uh, you know, the usual Navier-Stokes equation, mm -hmm. differential equation. And our current models are still trying to explain how it happens. 
Ma'am, yung gusto kong balikan yung, yung uh, metaphor ng pala. Yeah? Because I want to discuss, I want you to discuss uh, traffic jams, for example. You know? uh, but uh, one of the key features they say about complex systems is that it is nonlinear. Oh, no? yes. Can you explain uh, what nonlinearity means? Okay. Well, from mathematics, we know nonlinearity means that uh, well, one state is mapped into two or more different states. Mm -hmm. That's nonlinear. Uh, and in case of traffic, for example, you, you can never say that one method in, in solving a traffic problem will affect the same today and tomorrow because exactly the, the response of the system or the mapping of the system is different. It can be different, it can be mapped into many different things, nonlinear. So your, 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 the response of the system may be totally different from the response today. That's what makes it very difficult. For example, uh, when you have a, a jeepney in a traffic situation where it, and it parked in one side of the road, You'll never know how far the effect is. Maybe it's far down, there will be a jump because it started here and then everyone blocked the way. Or maybe not. And that's the nonlinearity there. So a complex system is inherently complicated, but not all complicated systems are actually complex. Mm -hmm. So to put it in a Venn diagram. <laughs> mm. That's good. Yeah. How about the um, can you explain? People talk about the butterfly effect. Bang mikin alam to sa nonlinearity. Can you explain that to the audience? The butterfly effect is a, an unusual adage when you talk about mathematical chaos. Mm -hmm. chaos. I think everyone will understand. Chaos is not like you know magulo. Usually when you say about chaos, ah, oh, it's so chaotic. This is so chaotic. It's actually not uh, the chaotic. The mathematical chaos is not that chaotic na magulo as we as we have in Filipino. Rather, it is more of the sensitivity to the initial condition. So it means that, say, traffic is a chaotic system in a mm -hmm. sense that it really is very dependent on the initial condition. So your decision to whether to park even for a moment or just park for maybe another minute will have a very different effect in the traffic condition, in the, not just in one part of the community, but probably in the entire metro. So this is uh, an example of a butterfly effect, that a very small effect can give or yield a very tremendous different effect in the future. So Fidel was very interesting to me as a chemist and a biochemist, and because we are teach team teaching a course on biological and social structures. And I just finished my uh, set of lectures on thermodynamic and kinetics. Uh, thermodynamics, very limited in terms of uh, the path that change will take, whereas kinetics captures that pathway of uh, the change. So the way you describe it to me, it looks like there's lots of uh, kinetic-based um, equations mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, complexity uh, science. And am I right, uh, Joma, is that simply uh, expressed by differential equations? Well, usually when we do mathematical modeling, uh, we make use of differential equations. So differential equations are equations that would involve derivatives or changes of quantities over time. Yes. So, uh, for example, uh, changes in the population over time can be affected by different factors or different entities as well. So, yes. that's how we work with it. Yeah. So, there's nothing um, totally esoteric about complexity science. It's still rooted in the fundamental physical chemical principles that we know from, um, well, uh, way back. And that's why we start our course on biological structures that way. And I would imagine that um, um, your area of research, John Robb, is, um, well, it covers so many disciplines. And um, you are involved in, uh, 
one ecosystem research yes, yes. with uh, biologists and um, sociologists. sociologists. <laughs> and uh, some of them are uh, actually right. uh, uh, urban planning experts. Yes. So in, when, you, when you look at the development of a community, there are so many factors that you need to consider. Uh, there are economic factors, social and psychological factors, and uh, even physical factors. Like for example, physical in the sense that how they, are they separated from each other, whether they are separated by natural boundaries like rivers or mountains, or how far they are from uh, their source of livelihood, mm -hmm. how arranged are their source of livelihood. Like for example, if you're doing farming and they use fertilizers, it will affect river systems because of the eutrophication and other you know, imbalance in the nutrients. And then uh, it would also depend on um, the economic factors like which, which part of the system or you know, the population system has more opportunities to sell their products like, or transport their products. So those who are near the shore are usually more economically progressed save because of the availability of you know, export, being able to communicate and interact economically with the neighboring cities. And uh, so in the one ecosystem, we try to understand how the uh, ecological and social, and uh, economic and social um, profile changes over time. For example, we know that in the provinces, we have several livelihoods. Some are in fishing, others are agriculture, husbandry, um, even quarries. You know, taking minerals from, from somewhere, mm -hmm. and sometimes even kainin. Yeah, I know that. And yeah. the problem is policy. When you when you say uh, that you kind of look in for a time, what will happen to the livelihood of these families? You know? So Absolutely. by understanding the profile of these communities and how they are connected to each other using a complex network approach and other uh, uh, modeling, uh, agent-based modeling approach, then. We, we hope to find a certain pattern that might point us out where could be the problem if you impose certain policies. Dear viewers, uh, John Robb is describing an emerging interdisciplinary research program funded by UP in Abra de Ilog Negros. Uh, Mindoro. Mindoro. Mindoro Negros. Um, Mindoro. Mindoro Occidental. Occidental. Oh, sorry. Mindoro Occidental. And um, what's interesting about that uh, area is there is a Mangyan community. And so um, you're talking about agent based modeling. And so would you say that the LGU is one agent? Would you say oh, okay. that the community of Mangyans would be another agent? Is that what it means? Or is it livelihood uh, as agents? It can be, it can be a, you know, agent-based modeling is a very broad class of modeling type. But uh, where an agent will be defined by the question, the research yeah. question. Yeah. Let's say you're asking about uh, the livelihood profile. The livelihood can be thought of as an agent. But if we're talking about the options that each of the family uh, have for which livelihood they want to take whenever this one is less opportunistic, mm -hmm. the other way around, mm -hmm. then the family becomes the agent. So whoever is sort of deciding, yeah. changing the state from, let's say, doing this to, in another time, doing yes. another state, then yes. that would be the agent. So in case of the policy, the policy is like, uh, you think, one can think of it as like, uh, you know, the icing model in magnets, so you have magnets, and mm -hmm. each uh, part of the magnet has either spin up or spin down state, yeah. then the whole thing, when you put it in a field, an external field, let's say in a, another magnetic field, then it will react. Mm -hmm. And the IC model gives a very interesting dynamics on this. And it, when you apply that to agents, the agents have their own decisions, they have their mm -hmm. local conditions that they feel, mm -hmm. and then they decide according to that. But there's also a global condition, which we call the environment. Mm -hmm. And the environment will give in the boundary conditions, uh, so to say. Mm -hmm. And that would be provided by the LGU, the national government. So let's say, for example, there's a policy, uh, maybe every June or July, no fishing. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Then that would be a boundary condition to the All situation. Right. I see. I think Jomer will be able yeah. to explain like when you have a differential equation, put boundary condition, then the differential equation will behave, you know, yes. system Different. will behave differently. So that that's um, well, very very enlightening to me. Uh, boundary conditions, something I can um, understand myself, uh, coming from uh, biology and molecular and cellular um, complex systems. But I think Jomar will tell us also something that's biological, um, medical, infectious. Because I understand you're also into infectious disease modeling, mm -hmm. pandemics, etc. So tell us. About that, Jomar? Uh, isa sa mga research na ginagawa ko would be on dengue modeling. So, mm -hmm. we'd like to uh, look into the dynamics of how dengue disease spreads throughout uh, the Philippines. Um, usually, gumagamit kami ng compartmentalized model. So, may tatlo kami compartments. Basically, may susceptible. Mm -hmm. Mayroon tayong mga infected and infectious individuals and there are those who are removed mm -hmm. or what recovered class. So, yun ang medyo basic na model na ginagamit natin. Mm -hmm. So, any changes uh, in the susceptible population is affected by their interaction with an infectious. Mm -hmm. So, they, it depends on the biting rate of the mosquito Mm -hmm. how many the, the, the vector population is, mm -hmm. um, effectivity, yung resistance din ng mga bawat individual, nagbabago din. So, mayroon din tayong mga ginagamit ng mga initial conditions mm -hmm. uh, para matignan natin kung paano gumagalaw ang, ang population ng bawat uh, human at saka ng mosquito population. Mm -hmm. And from there, we can look at what parameters uh, that affects the behavior or the development of each population. And from there, we can uh, strategize or make out some policies that would control the spread of uh, the disease. So, um... Ako, oh, Joma. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. May basic question. Mm. Sa pagbubuo ng inyong mathematical model for dengue infection, ano mga datos ang kailangan ng okay. Ang uh, madalas ang tinitignan natin, ilan yung mga na nagpapa nagkakasakit, okay? O sinong sinong nagkakaroon ng dengue. And that's one of the problems that is uh, 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 for for some researchers because uh, the data that we get are those who are hospitalized only. So we don't really actually know how many are really infected. And that's why when we make certain models or certain differential equations, we have to consider that. That uh, the data that we have are only those which are from the hospitals and not from the, from the houses. So, sinubukan nyo na ba sa Japanese encephalitis? Kasi ito yung issue ngayon. Ay, yung Japanese encephalitis. Maraming ng mga cases, tapos uh, may mga nagtatanong din na clinical practitioners mm -hmm. kung kakalat ba siya, may, ano, may um, mga nagpo-post na ng question na tanong na gano'n. <laughs> uh, I think we can, we can work with that yeah. with the enough data kasi we cannot look into the parameters. We cannot uh, estimate the parameters if we don't have enough data. And that's one of the problems here in the Philippines yeah. because data gathering is one of the issues here, the challenges here in the Philippines, and like in other countries. So the model is only as good as the, uh, the, the yes. data yes. and right. the way you're the able data. to complete the data. You can have a very perfect model, you can have a perfect differential equation, uh -oh. um, but if you don't have the data, you won't get the correct parameters and you cannot predict uh, or, or, or make no any other. Yeah, you can do and it's also the prediction. kind or level of data. So. I'll just address dengue, which mm -hmm. uh, I know has four zero types. Right. Dengue one, two, three, and four. Yes. And there's this phenomenon where you get infected with a second zero type, and your dengue becomes, um, you know, serious. More serious. Yes. There's a shock and um, hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So unless you're able to get data at that level, yes. you really can't 
interpret it meaningfully and come up with a good or accurate model. That's correct. So my question is, do you collaborate with uh, epidemiologists, infectious disease uh, um, MDs? Yeah, as of the moment, we don't have any epidemiologists, uh, a medical epidemiologist for now, but we had a, I had the conversation before. Mm -hmm. uh, we started with a project, but uh, mm -hmm. I got this post for some time, so. I see. So I'm not sure if, if the, that partic particular project progressed. Yeah. But at the very least, we should um, try to get data uh, during the uh, rainy season. So now we have a lot of rain, so your incidence of dengue tends to go up during the rainy season because of the mosquitoes in the um, breeding grounds, right? I think what? The, the, problem, sorry, the problem with the, the gathering of data, at least for the seal type, mm -hmm. is the practical reason. Because uh, in the root level, if you're a patient, actually there's no advantage if no. you know the seal type, practically. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the real problem is money. Because in the end, you have to pay for the testing the you know the acid, the acid, the acid. and it's a very expensive one. Yeah, but uh, UP Manila has developed uh, a kit. kit to determine I, but the antibody. I don't know if is that already uh, you know deployed to all the well, local. Well, I think it's not antibody based. It's uh, the click acid based it's more like yes. yeah. So it is in the process in of process being of um, deployed by the DOH. Once it's either free or you know, either but free they introduce or, it. Uh, to the public okay. during the National Science and Technology Week this year in July. Yeah, I see. That's okay. right. And it's supposed to be point of care, so um, it's a simple uh, lamp-based type of uh, PCR amplification, so it's uh, nucleic acid based, so it can be used in the um, LGUs, in the health centers. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major uh, uh, investments of UP also, and so the, the DOST. Yes. 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 So right. you, you have to connect with our uh, Denga researchers okay. in UP Manila. Okay. But maybe John Rob can tell us a bit about your team in uh, Abra de Ilog because you have gathered data, I imagine, quite accurately as a basis for your agent-based model, which you have published in uh, scientific journals. I think that uh, you were talking about uh, part of our team, uh, yes. part of another team working on it. Yes. So this is uh, Pancho. Okay. with the uh, purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we were able to publish a way to, uh, to I think that was about the prediction of um, the options that they have using uh, uh, game theory. So mm -hmm. the, the team of uh, Cross is uh, doing a, a game theory uh, based uh, modeling. So in the game theory, this is uh, another aspect of agent-based model, especially if you're talking about, you know, models like human beings who decide more, you know, free will, free yes. will, yes. free will, free will. Uh, In this case, it's like uh, the idea of economic models. Actually, you know, John Nash is yeah, the, the one who found um, this uh, topic of game theory. And uh, in this game theory, you know that you have, you know, you're trying to optimize certain utility given options. And by combining this with the agent-based model, the, uh, or, uh, the other team were able, to, in the group, were able to, uh, to, to check on the pa all possibilities of the livelihood. Mm -hmm. So what livelihood is more, most likely to appear in this uh, community whenever your uh, policy is this? So you have you introduce a certain perturbation in the system, yeah. and then their model, using uh, agent-based model with uh, game theory, put in, they can predict which one will come out. Most likely, for example, everyone go to uh, go to sari sari store, or everyone will go to uh, fishing, maybe. So it depends. Okay. So, would you say that at this uh, stage of your research, there are already um, um, positive interventions? Is there a plan, a game plan of how to improve uh, the community of the Mangyans together with the reefs 
and the ridges. So that was the original name of the yeah, yeah. Um, progr program. The Rift are, Ridge. We have some some talks, especially with our urban planning collaborators, that uh, we can actually do some you know intervention, and based on the models, we can choose the best possible uh, intervention. But because and that's near the Verde Island Passage, which is the uh, area of the highest marine biodiversity in the world, is ecotourism one of the op options for that area? Ecotourism? Uh, I'm not really sure, but I think ecotourism is uh, one of these options. Uh, it's just that I'm not, uh, the plan is not yet that, you know, okay. that concrete. Uh, but I'm sure there are uh, plans to apply the models that we have developed in order to decide on how to manage the yeah. system. Uh, involved by the LGB? Yes, yes, very important. involved. How do you explain this? I'm sure words like uh, <laughs> complexity, game theory, <laughs> perturbation. You know, this is very interesting. <laughs> uh, Helen, the head of, yes, the, uh, Helen, yeah. of this program, she's very, uh, you know, eager to share our results with the LGU. And every time we have publication, she always emails the, <laughs> the results and they are, hey, we have a result on this, and then he, he will email back and but tell us it's very exciting. Helen told me the mayor and the wife, yes. who's like a former mayor, they are UP graduates, and they're very, very, um, very open. open and supportive of the work that we are doing there. And I'd like to, uh, share at this point that uh, Helen and the team uh, have found a foreign partner that will try to uh, set up an eco uh, tourism yes. program there and they formed a group called Eco Resilience. Now um, Benji here is our expert on ecology so um, could you try to model how you think a place like Abra de Ilog should be developed as an ecotouristic uh, site. Oh, I, I've only been there once on the way to oh, the, the yeah. site of the I'm archaeology sorry. studies program in San Jose. Okay. Uh, but, uh, well, it's uh, the thing with complex systems is this uh, communities are complex, human communities are complex, and, uh, and the environment is complex. So. Uh, John Rob has already uh, brought out the word policy because all of his work would not really mean much if we cannot implement the right policies. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a major field of research in STS, Science, Technology and Society, uh, emerging systems and complex systems. Uh, how does it translate to how it will impact uh, policy? Uh, one of the major challenges is this: uh, the what the everybody has to think in in terms of chances or p prob probabilities. Parang ano? They say na haka yung chance. Parang sa lotto, di ba? What's the chance of winning the lotto? All of these different events will result in different outcomes. And unfortunately, uh, the government, anybody who is on the policy side, would like a sure outcome. And, uh, and the challenge is, uh, how are we going to relate all of these different outcomes and come up with the outcome that's the best for policy? Uh, that's one of, the, one of the research angles in what, what is called post-normal science. Because uh, all, all the stakeholders will have to input their information in order to understand and manage the outputs of a complex phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So that's what we call post-normal science. It's now being used, especially for DRRM. Mm -hmm. right. So Another area. for instance, uh, just to give an example, one of our previous guests, uh, Director René Solitum, mm -hmm. essentially adopts that purpose, because he does that approach, because he has been talking to different communities about earthquake hazards. So earthquakes are also complex things. Mm -hmm. We can't predict it. But the effects on communities is rather unimaginable for most people, but we have to get a grip on it. So whatever the responses are, are being translated into some policies which Philvox has adopted in communicating the risk. So I think 
in, in that sense, if in Abrete Ilo, since I really can't say much about it, just pass through it, I saw that there are a lot of deforested areas, so that is a, an ecological risk. So how will the ecological risk be quantified in the sense of a probability, mm -hmm. and how shall we translate the probability that is easily manageable by, by the LG? So that's one of the biggest challenges. I'd like to say that um, it's a good point you're making. We used to think of science as a, a simple scientific method approach. You have a hypothesis, that's the rational part. Then you do uh, some experiments, and that's, sorry, you do some observations with instruments or with your bare senses, and that's the empirical part. Then you do the experiments where you make interventions in the system, and that's the experimental part. And then you have an interplay of the three activities. But now, Fidel, because of the power of uh, numbers and computation, you have the iterative and then the predictive part of science. So can you tell us a bit more about how one can create these models that can more or less accurately predict what might happen in the future? And therefore, this should be useful in you know, guiding communities to um, save lives, to improve their livelihoods, and also to protect conserve the environment. How does this all, you know, originate, say, from number theory or coding theory? I listened to one of your lectures in our uh, postgraduate course last year. Maybe I'll talk about mathematics in general. Yeah. But regarding the construction of mathematical models, you know, yeah. uh, later on I'll, I'll ask Joma to explain that because he's the mathematical modeler. I'm basically a pure mathematician. We think of mathematics as the study of numbers and formulas. And actually, uh, mathematics is the study of patterns. You know? It's uh, that uses uh, the, the rules of logic, you know? deductive thinking, etc. You know? it's, 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 it's a way of, uh, of ordering ideas, ordering patterns. You know? uh, in a sense, it, it's a logical system. You know? but. Uh, it's also a tool that is very applicable. You know, we can think of mathematics in the abstract. You know? We can invent, it's, it's like language, we can invent uh, the, the, the terms and symbols, uh, attach meanings to them, and uh, define the rules that govern interactions between the symbols. You know? And then you create the mathematical system. You know? Those rules are called axioms. You know? uh, but we can think of mathematics as an abstract system. But what is beautiful about mathematics is because it also provides the language for interpreting natural phenomena. It's physics and chemistry. In fact, almost all uh, uh, areas of study right now use mathematics. So, mm -hmm. so it's not only an abstract uh, system of, of thought. No? It's also a tool uh, that we use to model uh, interpret phenomena, you know, basically, we do not know what the right interpretation is, no? but through science and mathematics, we always arrive at better and better interpretations of reality. So we, when we look at uh, um, a physical phenomena, we, uh, we represent, we, we find a representation of that, of that physical phenomena into a system of, uh, of mathematical symbols, no? numbers, differential equations, etc. We manipulate this you know, uh, in order to be able to predict the behavior of that, of that, uh, of that system. You know. Then you have to test the model, maybe. You test the model. You know. Making use of instruments that can um, get quantitative data. That's what we always yes. emphasize mm -hmm. with our students. Mm -hmm. You can um, you know, try to do experiments, but if it is not mathematical or quantitative in nature, uh, then your model cannot be very uh, meaningful. It cannot be refined. So, Jomar will tell us more about this. Well, when you, when you do usually experimentation, usually, uh, control control siya, no? may, may controlled conditions. Oh, uh. Controlled conditions. And then sometimes it's very expensive mm -mm. when you do experimentations. Maganda, when you have the model, 
when you make a particular model, which is usually based on physical, or on physics, uh, physical phenomena. Because historically, naman, mathematics and science are really of uh, very close related. Mathematics was regarded the language of science then. Um, so there were two, two probably two schools of thought. Merong those who are abstract. In, 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 in mathematics, and those who would like to work with the applied mm -hmm. mathematics, more, more practical mathematics. Um, so go to ako as, as an applied uh, person, uh, I'd like to look into uh, changes regarding, regarding uh, people, communities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Any, 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 any quantity for that matter, and then we look into uh, a particular model based on physics, or physical yeah. phenomenon, physical yeah. law, or reaction, and then we do the simulation. So, major less expensive, she? Yes. So, that's very important because um, in silico modeling right. is uh, the cheaper way to Analyze. design and experiment. Mm. And at this point, Fidel, I'm really missing one of our colleagues who just passed away. This is Baltazar Aguda, right. the uh, former executive director of the Philippine Genome Center. So um, Baltazar was a chemist, agricultural chemist by training, UPLB graduate. Then he moved to physical chemistry. Then he moved to computational chemistry, computational biology, then finally, uh, he did genetics and um, systems biology. Mm -hmm. And his particular area of research is another major disease area, which is cancer. And that interest I share with him. And let me just tell you why in silico modeling is so important. Also that modeling based on materials and therefore chemistry, I say, that's the most important discipline, chemistry. Because this is a material world. So you've got to understand a phenomenon on the basis of the materials. Then I'll have to add the energy because materials will not behave in a certain way, interact or um, compete, cooperate or compete if you do not know the energy inputs or the energy content of the material. So I always say, Tama naman si Einstein talaga. It's really matter and energy that would describe um, the material world. But anyway, going back to Baltz and my interest in cancer, napaka-complex system talaga niyan. Because in the cell, which is really um, the example of a biological complex system that is comparable to a, an electric circuit mm -hmm. network, Okay. In cancer, uh, there are key proteins that are mutated by uh, you know, mutagens, mutagens, environmental factors. Okay. There have been researchers who have identified, say, the five to seven major <laughs> hallmarks of cancer or the molecular pathways in cancer. And you will see this map of the cell. It's, it's actually like a cartoon mm -hmm. that shows you mutations in key proteins in these pathways, including extracellular signaling pathways, programmed cell death pathways, okay, so then cell cycle pathways that govern um, cell DNA synthesis, and then uh, mitosis, separation of the cell. So this is very, very complex. And they're all regulated by enzymes, okay? Because you have chemical reactions in the cell and there's lots of enzymes. They're regulated by uh, receptor proteins, okay? So what happens in the cancer cell is if you apply one drug that targets one pathway mm -hmm. or one protein in that pathway, the cell is so smart, it's so complex. Before you know it, it's going to develop resistance to that drug. Why? Because there is cross-talking. There is cross-talking uh, across parallel pathways. So the cell knows how to 
respond to the external uh, stimulus, which is the drug that will kill it. So nowadays, the approach to uh, cancer therapy is really um, multiple therapies or uh, synergistic therapies to ensure what we call synthetic lethality. So there's a term now called synthetic lethality in um, uh, drug uh, research. And you need to target many pathways all at the same time. Ideally, or conceptually, the different targets that are critical in uh, getting that cancer to uh, cell to proliferate. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Actually, that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon as far as complexity is concerned because uh, in complexity that is called robustness. Yes. So that uh, complex systems are very robust and uh, as you, mm -hmm. as you uh, have described it, you can think of the cell as a network of proteins. This is, uh, I think it was in uh, five or ten years ago yeah. that the entire network of a yeast cell, mm -hmm. protein network of a yeast cell was uh, elucidated. And uh, from there, you can identify important proteins uh, that is responsible for different pathways. And targeting one of these, or maybe two or three or a few of these, uh, just says that it's not guaranteed to work no. because no. Uh, there are it's redundant works. pathways. Redundant. That cross protein. It's like traffic. No? <laughs> it's like traffic that when you block one, one, one lane or block one street, then vehicles will just try to <laughs> use other ways. It's just like that. And in cancer, it's very uh, amazing. <laughs> exactly. So I think cancer is still uh, the symbol of our, um, you know, of our age or the complexity of our age in terms of disease. It's the most serious disease and it's coming from the environment. So very little cancer is inherited. It's a genetic disease, but it's not inherited from your parents. Only a few cases are when the mutated cells are the germ cells and they are passed on to the progeny to the children. Wow, this is a fantastic uh, topic and we have five minutes to go so maybe we need um, like a one minute statement from each of us but I'd like to do my statement to say that Fidel is organizing a system-wide, UP system-wide complexity study group or study center. Uh, it's about time we do this because there's so many people interested in complexity science. So Fidel, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, one thing we're learning today is that complex systems are everywhere. No, We've yeah. talked about uh, communities in urban Elog, uh, epidemics, ecosystems, cancer. Yeah. You know, a lot of things around us can be modeled using complex networks. No? And because of their complexity, uh, uh, we need a multi multiplicity of perspectives and disciplines studying these phenomena. Yeah. Now, for example, uh, 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 John Rob was talking about the project in Upper the e Elog uh, involving, uh, well, you're a physicist, there's a biologist, there's an uh, urban planner, there's a sociologist. You know? Uh, phenomena right now are so interrelated that we need ideas coming from dis different disciplines. No? And uh, so me the world is complex, many of our problems are complex, and therefore the solutions will come from uh, coming together of uh, people from different disciplines. That's, that is why we're identifying people who want to work together uh, to, to look at uh, phenomena and problems like this. No? So there will be physicists, there will be people uh, in, in mass communication, uh, mathematicians. Uh, we've already um, uh, heard some interest from people in the health sciences yeah. to come together. You know, we, we want to create a platform where we can put our minds together and look at uh, uh, complex problems of society. You know? So we still do not know exactly what, what form it will have, yeah. but it's, it's about time that uh, we get together people to uh, you know, uh, look at things uh, from a complex science perspective. At, at, say, at the same time, of course, we were talking about data. You know? We need data people too, because right now yeah. the, the, the currency of, uh, 
all science is, yes, is data. data. But it's and not enough that you have data. data. What is important right. is that you extract insights from that data. Yeah. And, and this is uh, where we want these people to be, uh, um, all these people to be contributing. Um, but actually, before we end, can I just go back to the, 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 the general characteristics of complex systems? We heard that the, the term lin linearity, mm -hmm. uh, John Rob talked about robustness, no? but other key features, uh, emergent behavior, yes. um, emergent behavior, so self-organization. Self uh, John Rob, can you just give us just a few lines about these very important characteristics of complex systems. Well, uh, early on, we talked about that uh, complex systems are you know, complex, being composed of simple things. And uh, what is essential, or rather, uh, what is uh, significant in uh, determining the eventual dynamics of the whole thing is the interactions. And it is in this interaction that certain other properties emerge. Okay, like um, uh, you know, it's like how, how the entire, let's say you have a polit political system, how the entire political system eventually comes out with a uniform opinion about one thing, like saying yes to a, to a vote, no, a decision, or no. That is also a complex uh, dynamics in, in itself. This is what we call the opinion dynamics in the mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. of uh, people. Mm -hmm. And when, when something emerges, it's just that you cannot study the emergent behavior by simply looking at the level of the individuals composing it. And that is why we have, let's say, even if the physicists know that electrons are attracted to protons and that the electrons are you know, moving around the protons in a, in a nucleus of a, an atom, still, it needs more in order to study its chemical properties. Sure. So, in a sense, chemical properties are emergent yeah. properties of those components that uh, comprises uh, atoms, even true. molecules. For example, one would be baffled by the idea that sodium by itself is an explosive, highly reactive yeah. no. uh, uh, chemical. Chlorine is highly you know, reactive also. In fact, it is very uh, dangerous to you know, biological uh, life. But when you put them together, something amazing happens. And in itself, that's an emergent property that you cannot predict from the individual sodium and the individual chemical. Isang madalas nakikita na tayo pag di ba ng mga ibon, di ba? Migration. When you look at a flock of birds, no, they move in such wonderful unison. Uh, they, they, they soar, they swoop down, they change direction without, without uh, collisions, no? Without nobody, without a single, or maybe a single leader. No? Basically, maybe this is a very nice example of a complex system that that exhibits emergent behavior that is also self-organizing behavior. Yeah, even like when you look at the birds during their, uh, what do you call that? The, the, the migration. migration. migration, migration. Uh, they usually do uh, the, the delta formation. Mm -hmm. And you know, delta formation is actually the most efficient formation when you move very fast. Because the one on the front breaks the wind and all the others are more relaxed. They use less energy. And that they do that automatically. Nobody tells them to do, hey, hey, let's go, delta formation. No, nobody does. No, but there's that. probably a leader, the leader, you know, and uh, there's a kind of a quorum sense. Actually, that's interesting. So, yeah, and it's... Because they have no leader according to... No one assigns okay, a leader. That's right. No yeah, there's a natural anyone leader can emerges. Be a leader. Yes, yes, yes. So, so it's a bit kind of a sensitivity emerges. about it. So whoever is strongest among them, the it's what you call self-organization yes. or self-assembly. So this 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 uh, <laughs> emerging, this this low uh, self-organization that you yes. see in a flock of birds is something that you can only see at the global level. You know, if you look at the global level, for example, the the behavior of each bird, you cannot predict this kind of self-organizing uh, phenomenon. I think we need to talk about this at another <laughs> show, and I like ask Benji to talk about the STS. Your baby, now his baby, <laughs> and it's really the basis for interdisciplinarity and it would really you know, support our complexity science uh, studies. So Benji? Well, all of these uh, phenomena, social, interaction social and uh, science, society and science, actually complex. And its major relevance today, is especially for climate change, with all these hurricanes and typhoons, uh, battering the state of Florida and America and the Caribbean islands, 
Uh, in Manila. Is in Manila. <laughs> is risk. Risk itself Perception. is an emergent property of a complex system. Right. Uh, that's been long recognized in STS studies ever since. Now, uh, the big challenge now is how can we translate this to policy? Because policy is usually Usually, if you say there's policy, that's it. <laughs> there's not much, much room for external order. For there's not much wiggle room, as they say. But uh, risk and other responses are not like that. So that's one big challenge for SPS now, and it's very relevant for the Philippines, especially for disasters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why we have to put up some effort in our SDS program to be an uh, important focus for research and it's definitely interdisciplinary. We have to involve all of our expertise uh, in the university, not just in Diliman, but in other campuses too. Okay. Well, dear viewers, I think we'd like um, to hear from you about this show. One of the uh, hallmarks of uh, complex systems is feedback looping. So we're gonna hear this from you and you can imagine there's so many other topics that we could discuss in Science Innovation series of TV Up, including financial risks <laughs> and risk taking. And Jomar is an expert on that as well. So um, thank you very much my co-hosts Fidel and Benji and our um, young and um, very knowledgeable guests, Jamar and um, John Rob. And thank you everyone for being with us in TV Ops Science Innovation Series. Maraming salamat po. <laughs>